Thank you. Five losses in one September to September year. It was about 10 years ago, and in December I lost my good friend, Anne. In February, I got a phone call from my mother that my grandmother, Rebecca, had died. And in April, I lost another close friend, Steph, to leukemia. In June, I went through my own heartbreak. My romantic relationship ended. And then the next September, that following September, I was standing with my mother as we watched my father take his last breath. I could barely catch my own breath that year. It, was, it took me months, actually, to move through that grief. When we talk about grief, which I generally consider sadness, helplessness, anger, and disappointment, most of us think of the losses I just described. But I want to talk about a different kind of grief. One of us, one that most of us don't really even consider that we experience, we don't realize it's even taking place. Instead, it's disguised in front of us as this kind of grief. Leftover anger, bitterness, blame, cynicism, grudges, hostility, negativity, regret, resentment, sarcasm, self-hate, and long-standing hurt. That's all disguised grief. Or it might be dis disguised inside of you, buried, childhood or even from adulthood. The difference between what you experienced, between what you needed, what you wanted, what you dreamed of, and what really occurred, both grief. <clears throat> when you move through grief and really heal the grief, including disguised grief, you open yourself up to forgiveness, to happiness, to a healthier life, and much more joy. In my 30 years as a psychologist, and going through my multiple losses, what I've realized is that there's, there's not only a process, but there's a healing nature to grief. And it's that healing process that I want to talk about that I've developed to help people reclaim their lives. It's what I call grief reset protocol. The first is to grieve unspoken dimensions. The second is to reflect on the memory itself. The third is to inquire more deeply. The fourth is to extract the good. And the fifth is to forgive yourself and others. Let's start with the G then. How do you uncover grief? It takes knowing what you're grieving about. It involves grieving over what you got and didn't deserve. It's all forms of abuse. It's chaos. It might be criticism. It's grieving over what you deserved and didn't get. That's the good stuff. The first one's the bad stuff. The second one's the good stuff. And that means grieving over uh, the consistent support, love, nurturance, or praise that we may not have received. It's grieving over what never was. Think of that as the facts and circumstances of your early life. So that might be the education or the opportunities you had when you were young. It's also grieving over what is not now. Those are the facts and circumstances of your current life and grieving over what may never be. That might be support from someone or someone saying something to you that you wish they'd say, it just never comes. The next then is to reflect on the memory. How do you reflect on the memory? That means going into the memory, spending some time with the memory. Now you can do that all sorts of ways and shift into memory itself by being in nature by taking a walk or a hike. You could read, you could write, you could journal, listen to music, play music, engage with, in, a, in a conversation with a close friend or a loved one. Know that when you take time with the memory, that more details and more memories may come. The next step then is 
eye to inquire more deeply, making sense of the memory. So how do we make sense of the memory? What that really involves is understanding how the experience impacted you when, when they occur, the experience itself occurred or when many experiences occurred. It's to understand the impact. The second is to understand the relevance. How have those experiences been relevant to you as you've aged? And the third is to understand what significance these experiences have on your life today. So really, in, this is de deepening the experience of what we're doing here. I was at a conference lunch a few years ago with a man who was in his 70s that I will call Paul. Now, Paul was very, very gracious. He turned to me and asked what I did professionally, and when I took the time to describe what I did, he ended up, within moments, telling me about something that happened to him in high school that involved singing. It was during his senior year in high school. Now, remember, I'm a psychologist. People tell their stories like that a lot. <laughs> so we're, we're sitting, and he, he tells me that he was singing his last senior high school concert in front of 2,000 people, two solos. After the performance, one of his close friends came up to him and said, Paul, you sang so flat. You should be so embarrassed. Never sing solos again in front of people. And you know what? Paul followed that advice. He, except he took it one step further. He never sang publicly again. What's interesting here is that he carried the grief of what never was what is not now, and what may never be, because he made a decision to stop singing. Had he dealt with that grief and resolved that experience, it's possible that he could have brought singing back into his life, something that brought him much joy. I can only imagine what his life would have been like if he had reclaimed that, if he'd made a different decision in his 20s, 30s, 40s, or even later, to bring that joyful experience back into his life. What's challenging here is that when we go through experiences, especially painful ones, we hold attitudes, we hold beliefs, and we make decisions that sometimes cause us even more pain. So these are the questions then to deepen our inquiry even further. And that is, how did these experiences change what I believed? How did these experiences change the attitudes that I hold? And how did these experiences change the decisions I made? That takes us to E, which is to extract the good. When I was a young child, I was bullied, as many kids go through, and while the teasing and the taunting and the mocking all hurt, it was being left out, being excluded, that actually was the one that affected me the most. Because when I thought about that, it felt like I would never fit in, I'd never belong, and then I would be all alone. I would be with my mom and sitting at the kitchen table, and she'd kind of grab my hands in hers, and. She'd, she'd want to soothe me and say, oh, Joan, it, it'll be okay. Now, while it helped me feel a little bit better in the moment, I would go back to school and it would happen again. What, what it involved for me was to take the time to resolve and make meaning or make sense of what those experiences did to me and who I wanted to become as a result of that. And... I did take that time in my mid-twenties, and as I did that, I realized that I never wanted to hurt someone the way I'd been hurt. So I made a decision to hold kindness as one of my highest values, and it's something that I practice living into every day. Now, most people don't necessarily dig into the benefit and try to understand the benefit of painful experiences 
Yet doing this is such an important element of the whole grief reset protocol. It really is important to try to tease out what it is that benefited me, who I became as a result of that. So what is it that you can extract for good? And then that brings us to F, to forgive. Here's the deal. To really move through disguised grief, you have to know and accept that you can never do what was undone, nor undo what was done. You can never do what was undone, and you can never undo what was done. For instance, you can never do praise you never gave. And you can never undo mean words you may have said. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean that you agree and you condone what happened. All it means is that you accept the truth that the experiences occurred. Here then is what to forgive. And it's, again, it takes us deeper into the process. It's forgiving yourself for what you did or did not know. It's forgiving also yourself for what you did or did not do. It's forgiving others for what they did or did not know. And it's forgiving others for what they did or did not do. Understand this too takes very conscious practice over time. So that in essence is the grief reset protocol. The first is to grieve unspoken dimensions. The second is to reflect on the memory itself. The third is to inquire more deeply. The fourth is to extract the good. And the fifth is to forgive yourself and others. When you walk this framework all the way through to the end, to forgiveness, you give yourself a chance to free yourself from your old life story. Which means that you can make different decisions. You can hold different attitudes and beliefs. Who do you want to become? What new story do you want to live into and create? I knew that I needed to heal those five losses that I experienced that September to September year. My friend Ann, my grandmother, my friend Steph, my partner, and also my dad. I did take the time to grieve that, to make sense of what took place. I want you to do the same. Use this grief reset protocol. Take some time with it. Do it soon. I know how it changes people for the better when they allow themselves to move through, make sense, and clear that grief. The beauty of it is that grief opens to laughter and joy. Forgiveness opens to deeper connections. And also know that the more you stay present to the truth of what your life was, the more you free yourself to create what you want your life to be.